My name is Erica Wagner. I'm an author and a critic. I write for the New Statesman. I write for Harper's Bazaar. And I'm really thrilled to be here this afternoon talking to Matt Salinger, the son of J.D. Salinger, who's come over here to Britain to talk about his father's work. My first question is, I heard you say, read you say, that you have spent quite a few decades, 58 years, you said, sort of avoiding talking about this, not engaging with your father's work. Tell me what brought about this change. Well, I engaged with my father's work, but, but not in a public way. Not in a public way, way yes. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the 100th of anniversary course. of his birth. Um, Penguin Random House is, is re-releasing new, well, releasing new editions of, of his books. Um, I thought that deserved a little bit of support, but would I be here for that? No. It seemed like a good time to correct some, uh, we'll just call them myths or mis misapprehensions, maybe? misapprehensions <laughs> works um, uh, that have been propagated by, by various uh, biographers and, and reporters that um, um, I just thought it was time that the, the readers that my father cared most about um, should know some truths. Um, and I wanted to tell them personally that uh, yes, he did keep writing, and yes, we were going to publish pretty much everything that he wrote. And as you said, you corrected me saying, of course, you have been engaged with your father's work for many years, and you've been a staunch uh, defender, I would say, of his work as regards copyright, as regards, yeah. and there's been, as I understand, um, quite a lot of that to do. Was that, um, did you always know you would take that kind of stuff on? Because so you've always been dealing with his estate, I want to say, with his work. Well, I, I, I wasn't really involved with his work or estate until he died. Um, uh, other than sort of when he'd come out of his workroom you know, very excited about something he'd written and would want to read it to me or something, you know, but, um, and enjoying his work. But I never talked about it and I never was involved in the business of it at all. I mean, I knew his agents, um, I knew his publisher, but um, no, I had my own life and my own family and I was doing, I was doing that. Yeah. Um, when he died, there was a void. Um, and I'm co-trustee of, of the literary trust that he set up, and there were some things that needed an immediate attention. Um, so I, I quickly took a copyright law course. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think he was unfairly um, uh, uh, described by some people as litigious. Um, he, he wasn't, he, he, he just, he had a, a an ethical line, and if you came up and passed that ethical line, you know he was going to defend his work and his rights and his moral rights, which are much more easily defended in Europe than than in the in the U.S. But he believed in a, a creator's moral rights. Um, I was determined to do a good job with that as well as everything else. And one of the things it's interesting that defense of moral rights. As a reader of his work over the years, and, and one of the things that's been fascinating to me about engaging with this centenary and coming back to his work, a lot of which I hadn't read in a long time, is fascinating to read it as an older person. Do you, do you remember what you thought as a kid, as a young person? Yeah, I just heard my father's voice. Right. when I was reading the books, um, and his sense of humor, his... Um, They're so funny. They are funny. <laughs> they are funny. Um, they're imbued with, with the best of him, the, his love, his kindness, his uh, empathy, I mean, I think is in all the characters. I, it's funny, because the next thing I was going to say was, to me, and again, I get this, I feel like I get this more as a grown-up <laughs> than as a kid. They're so funny and they're so sweet. Hmm. That's, that's the word, the kind of sweetness of these people. The reader is able to come to them, it seems to me, in a very pure way, mm -hmm. because of the way the works have been defended. There aren't films, 
There aren't even pictures on the cover. Tell me a, a little bit about that sort of defense of the work, your, your father's and now yours. Yeah, I, th I, th I think of it as, it's, a, it, it's um, the same meaning, I guess. I think of it as protection, but, but protection, defense, very similar. Defense seems a little bit more aggressive. Yes. Um, but I'm not sure that's right, the, connotatively. But uh, yeah, my father believed absolutely in the author slash writer slash creator reader relationship. Um, it was the most important relationship in his life. Um, the only word I've come up for it is, is, is sacred. And he really felt it was sacred. Um, he believed that the writer's words should not be interpreted or interfered with or corrupted or, or, or you know, thrown in any one direction or another by anybody for any reason, uh, just the reader. Um, the reader should get those words as directly and as purely as possible. Um, and he, he wrote a letter to a director once who wanted to direct Catcher and he said, I write for the private screening room in each reader's head. That, that's the only movie screen that I care about. Um, when you have artwork, Imagine Leonardo DiCaprio playing Holden, you know, a few years ago when he was younger. Readers would be picturing him. Yes. Um, new readers would come to it knowing he played it and unfamiliar with anything, they'd be picturing Leonardo. My father didn't want any of that. Uh, he didn't want any artwork. Anything that would, that would change the reader's ability, diminish the reader's ability to approach the material openly. Um, and no afterward, no forward, no, yep. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and I think that's really cool. I picked up on something you said about um, the work you're looking at now, all this material that will eventually come out to us. Do you have a, do you have a time frame? <laughs> For that? Uh, if you read the Ardi Guardian piece, uh, I said not less than three years and not more than ten. I, I think okay, most that's... likely it's five or six years. Right. Um, but I'm not positive. Um, I'm I'm going as fast as I can while being as careful as I can, and those two things don't always go together. Can you? Are you willing to say a little bit about sort of what that involves, even in terms of like the the shape of the material that you're looking at? Yeah, I'll just say that it, it, it's 50 years worth. I mean, he, he wrote for six, seven, eight hours a day um, for 50 years. Uh, so it's an awful lot of material. Um, some of it's typed, some of it's handwritten, some of it's a combin a lot of it's a combination because he typed usually double spaced and then would annotate by hand. I don't know the shape of it yet or what the, the, the end use a crass publishing term uh, product will be. <laughs> yep. But even if I did, I wouldn't tell you because... Fair enough. <laughs> if I were to do that now after being so protective for so many years, Indeed. I would be doing him a disservice and I would be doing the reader a disservice. Yes. Well, and it's funny, I have to ask you the question, but I don't really want to know. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, thank because you. I, want it, I want it when it comes in the same... Right way. Right. But you mentioned too, um, you know, I had this image of your father coming out of his office excited if he'd mm -hmm. written something. I'm very interested in that. You know, I teach, I teach writing and I teach at Goldsmiths and I'm always saying to my students, it's not about publication <laughs> and it's not about getting an agent. Mm. It's about doing it for yourself. Yeah. And I sometimes worry that they think, oh, you know, easy for her to say. But I think your father is a very good example of someone who really has chosen to be an artist for the sake of it. Can you talk a bit about that, that decision? It seems to me he took a, a long time. The last piece he published was in 1965, I think. And so what marked that transition into an even greater purity of composition, I want to say? 
I'm not sure it was greater. Um, it, 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 the only thing that changed was he stopped publishing. The, the writing process remained identical. He was able to keep his solitude a bit better. I mean, if, if he had published in the late 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s, actually, the longer he waited, the more of an event it would have been. Um, and I hate using that word too, but that's what it would have been. Um, and if it <coughs> didn't kill him, it, it would have certainly uh, damaged his, he found that kind of attention just hugely disruptive. Um, but I agree with you absolutely. And I was talking yesterday up at the University of East Anglia with, with a, a, a young professor of the creative writing program who was talking about why her students are writers and, and what she tells them. And it was very much like you, I, I guess. And it's great you're doing this because as an independent film producer, I, I audition a lot of young actors. Um, and I can tell almost immediately whether somebody's in it to become uh, famous. Uh, an acting coach I know has on his website, um, you know, if you knew you weren't going to get a paid acting role in the next three years, would you keep acting? I think that same question is a, is a good one to ask young writers because often they're not going to be published and they have to really need to do what they do. That's right. My father needed to do what he did. Uh, some uh, clueless reporters uh, have asked me, well, did he stop writing? Is that why he stopped publishing? He just stopped. How can a writer stop writing? I, I don't even understand that. Um, certainly not the kind of writer my father was. Well, I think writing, it's strange how I think writing particularly has strangely become, and I would say your, your father was at the beginning of this, you know, has been very bound up in the idea of celebrity. Oh. You know, um, people accept that you might just want to play the violin and you know you're not going to be in the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. But writers, for some reason, are perceived to want to be famous and to only want publication. He, he would probably cop to that, sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, but, but he, when he first began, yeah. he had an ego. He wasn't as evolved spiritually then as he became later in life and, and had he would be the first to refer to himself as a horse's ass um, you know, when, right. when, he, when he began and a bit of a show off in, in his writing style. Um, it's why those early stories, he's never allowed to be published. Right. Um, he wasn't proud of them in the, in the same way that he was proud of his mature work when he had sort of become a different person. Yes. Tell me a little bit, if you will, about that spiritual evolution. Because again, returning to his work, something that I really didn't think about when I was younger is all the references to Eastern spirituality to to Buddhism, it's it's really deep in there. And in a way, again, as a young person, I didn't perceive, but it fascinates me now. I said writing was was the sort of core of his life, but but spirituality was uh, every bit as much. Um, and he studied it. Um, he immersed himself in it for decades and decades and decades. And and it wasn't just Advaita Vedanta. He, you know, he writes about Advaita Vedanta more in his books, but he, he studied you know, Jewish mysticism. He studied Islamic mysticism. He studied Catholic mysticism. Uh, he's, it was always the mystical wing of religions that he was drawn to, um, that one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship. Um, yeah, it, it's in everything he wrote, um, and it's in everything that is unpublished also. It was who he was as much as being a writer. In the way, too, I suppose, that so many of his characters don't seem to be at home in the world. <laughs> They're looking for something else, or Holden certainly is with his idea about phonies everywhere. And to me, when I think about the glass children and the way that they are kind of set apart, he didn't feel like he belonged from the time he was a little boy. Um, uh, and much of his growing up had to do with finding a place, finding people that he did belong with. Um, 
he didn't find it in the military. He didn't find it in schools. Um, he found it in books and, and studying and, and in spirituality. Um, you know, he considered books and authors to be his friends. Like he, he said to me, <laughs> he said to me once, um, as I once asked him the question, now I'm asked about him, you know, don't you ever get lonely? Right. Um, this was sort of between girlfriends and, and long stretches where I'd, I'd call him on the phone and, and <coughs> <coughs> it took him a while because, and he'd say, I haven't used my voice since Tuesday. I asked him if he was lonely and he, he, he said, no, I, I am surrounded by my friends. Uh, most of them are dead and they're in my imagination now, but a lot of them are in books and I know precisely what book I want to take down if I'm in a certain mood. Right. Or who I want to spend time with this evening. And I take down that book. I think it led him to have a pretty interesting and happy life because he got to spend time with some interesting Great people. people. Yeah. How did that, because you too are a creative person, I wonder how that affected you growing up, seeing this complete engagement, I want to say, with an imaginative world. How was that for you? Well, I, I didn't go to Wall Street. <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, I became an actor. Um, I sort of took up something both he and my mother enjoyed doing when they were young and, and then gave up for other things. My mother became a Jungian therapist. My father became a writer. But he loved acting when he was young. Um, uh, I wrote a little bit. I wrote through college. Um, uh, studied with Joyce Carol Oates. Um, uh, but uh, I, I didn't find joy in writing. Right. Um, it was a slog, and I had a big shadow <laughs> yes. behind me. Yeah. Um, you have a name to carry around, maybe. Yeah, and that thing was liberating, you know, throwing myself into a character, creating a character. But I would argue in his writing, he created all of those characters as, a, as an actor creates characters. Um, that's why his dialogue is so his good. His dialogue is so wonderful. Yeah. Because uh, he inhabited those, and, you know, the, this woman I was speaking to yesterday was a real feminist and she, he, she said, you know, you, he wrote female characters as well as anybody. Yes. Um, she particularly loved Franny, but my father would say his, his writing was genderless and I, I think that was largely true. I, I think, and again, as, as a reader coming back to them, I have a 19-year-old son and when I was younger I never thought about the mothers mm -hmm. that appear throughout your father's books, and now they they really interest me. You know, I Bessie's was the young a person. Pip, yes, right? Bessie is a pip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she said yeah. she reminded me a little of my own mother. I have to say, my New York mother. Um, but it's you use the word joy, just then. It sounds like his writing brought your father oh, great joy. Absolutely, it made him happy. Absolutely. The, the, the knock-on effects of his writing, some of the repercussions of his writing, the attention, the, the fame, um, he didn't want any of that. Um, and and th that was his cross to bear. Um, but, but the actual writing process, yeah, absolutely joyful. What is it about your father's work that yeah. speaks to so many people, so many generations? People respond to his characters with the kind of open heart and and love and the kind of relief that Mr. Antolini talks about with yes. with Holden to yeah. find somebody else that feels the way you do. You find a kindred s spirit, um, a landsman. I think he. Uh, yes. My father used that term. I, I I think he used it in Catcher too. What a one. What a, you know. When you feel like you're alone in the world and, and a little bit lost, um, to, to find that is, is uh, like salvation. Um, and everybody feels lost. Everybody loses their way in life. Whether you're 16 or you're you know, 76, you know, we question our choices. We question you know, how we're living, who we're living with, what we're doing. Um, and that was Holden. That was my father. Um, 
uh, he thought there was a better way, a kinder way. Another thing I think about, I asked about you as a young man reading, his feeling for young people mm. is so remarkable. Yeah. Was that something you saw, I don't know, with your friends? Absolutely. Uh, too? Absolutely. He writes kids so well. How could a man like that not get along well with kids? I mean, what I remember most about my father when, when I was young is his, his eyes. Um, <laughs> you had his total engagement, his right. total attention. And he was pulling things out of you um, in a way. I mean, he, he wanted to know everything you were thinking and everything you were, I mean, all my friends thought he was the coolest father. Um, really? Every single one of them. Because I also think, and you mentioned this in the interview that you did in The Guardian, I have always been fascinated by, in our age of celebrity, uh, that the people who wish to be private are described as being reclusive. Well, I went, I went further in the, yes. and I don't remember if they published this or not, but there's a progression that you can see. And it makes sense. And I feel for some of the journalists that, that, that tried to interview him or that were told by their editors to go get a story on yes. Salinger, because they could never talk to him. They couldn't talk to his family. They couldn't talk to his close friends. So what were they going to do? They were going to rehash old stories or f and try to embellish them or make them sound more extreme yes. uh, or compelling or prurient or whatever to kind of get the attention of the editor or the reader. Um, or they were going to talk to people that didn't know him at all. Um, I remember in an early story where our mailman was 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 interviewed and said he would go in and drink scotch with my father, you know, to the wee eye. He'd never been inside our house, and my father doesn't drink scotch, you know. Right. I mean, it's just nonsense. I understand the position they were in. Um, and it is unlike most other uh, people, because most other people want the attention. Want, yes. Want the fame. Um, and yeah, he could have cared less. And yes, and again, these days, if you don't want the fame, you're weird. You're weird. And and he went from being um, oh, I, I had all the words worked out, but it, but it was um, retiring, right? To um, to uh, reclusive, to antisocial, to hermetic, right? To notoriously antisocial and hermetic each in an effort to make it seem more extreme and yes. more newsworthy. Well, and but also perhaps as in a way to explain why they didn't get the story. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I actually didn't think of that, but you're probably you know, right. You got to well, he's notoriously hermetic. That's why I couldn't talk to him, boss. I mean, the smart readers of those pieces would see through it, I think. Yes. But there's a lot of people that might approach his material that weren't smart enough or weren't savvy enough about how journalism works no, to, to no. see through that. Yes. And what it did effectively was pathologize him. Yes. Um, into, and there, you know, he would say there were freakish aspects to, to his, his um, character and self and, uh, but. Well, it, who doesn't? Exactly. Yeah, I agree. You know. <laughs> I agree. Uh, but yeah, it, it made him into a real freak. Um. And I think also, I wonder, because, um, and I, I was asked about this uh, once, you know, some people I think have said, because for instance, Mark David Chapman, who killed John Lennon, said that Catcher in the Rye had such an influence yeah. on him. Right. So that too has, you know, what, what do you say to that kind of stuff? I say nonsense. Um, you know, how many people have read Catcher in the Rye, we were just yes. talking to 72 million people. There have been two maniacs that happened to have read it um, and then went out and killed somebody or did something extreme. What about the other 71 million? <laughs> you know, <laughs> However many. The only susceptibility to, to that is if, if you write about outsiders, as he did, most artists feel apart from the world in some way, that they're observers. 
uh, so many of their characters are observers. Yeah. Um, that's part of the sensibility and the sensitivity that you have to have as an artist. So you write those characters and people are going to be attracted to them that feel like outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you're gonna get a couple of crazed lunatics yeah. in that bunch. What was your answer when you were asked? That? Pretty much that, that was, I <laughs> have to say. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much that is that people will always pick up on those exceptions and yes exactly how many people have read so you've been traveling around now and engaging with your father's audiences you know we're about to uh, do an event this evening with penguin and it will be full of people who love your father's work now that he's gone i know what it's like to lose a parent i loved how is that for you? Hmm. I was doing this out of a sense of duty because I thought it was the right thing to do and because I wanted to correct some misapprehensions out there and to, and to communicate a couple of facts to his readers. Um, I wasn't prepared to enjoy myself. Um, I'm not sure I've enjoyed myself, but, but I've been moved and, and I've been touched by uh, a lot of people have continued to read him. A lot of people have rediscovered him, have gone back to his books um, at later stages in their lives. Um, I had a fascinating discussion with, with somebody recently at, at one of these talks who had read um, uh, his work and identified with Holden when he was young and then identified with uh, Buddy. Yes. You know, and, um, and then identified with Seymour. Um, it depends where you are in your life and what's happening, but th the fact that they're alive in that way um, is, is thrilling. And I go back to Mr. Antolini and what he said to Holden, you'll be surprised to know how many people out there are, feel exactly as you do and what a thrill it will be um, for you to find those people and to find clues that they left, um, how they got themselves out of the morass that you're feeling right now. And I think that's what my father did in his uh, four published books and his unpublished material. I, th I think he really was tapped into that and, and cared about those people and wanted to help them. And I'm not making him into some <laughs> saint life. He, he had plenty of faults, um, as he'd be the first to say, but, but his best self was absolutely glued into that. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. It's been really marvelous talking to you. Thank you. This has been fun.